Section 4 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mario Pineda. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 4. Selections from the Man with the Broken Ear by Edmund About, translated by Henry Holt. The Victim. Leon took his bunch of keys and opened the long oak box on which he had been seated. The lid being raised, they saw a great linen casket, which enclosed a magnificent walnut box carefully polished on the outside, lined on the inside with white silk and padded. The others brought their lamps and candles near, and the colonel of the twenty-third of the line appeared as if he were in a chapel illuminated for his lying in state. One would have said that the man was asleep. The perfect preservation of the body attested the paternal care of the murderer. It was truly a remarkable preparation, and would have borne comparison with the finest European mummies described by Big Dazir in 1779 and by the younger Pymorian in 1787. The part best preserved, as is always the case, was the face. All the features had maintained a proud and manly expression. If any old friend of the colonel had been at the opening of the third box, he would have recognized him at first sight. Undoubtedly, the point of the nose was a little sharper the nostrils less expanded and thinner, and the bridge a little more marked than in the year 1813. The eyelids were thinned, the lips pinched, the corners of the mouth drawn down, the cheek bones too prominent, and the neck visibly shrunken, which exaggerated the prominence of the chin and larynx. But the eyelids were closed without contraction, and the sockets much less hollow than one could have expected. The mouth was not at all distorted, like the mouth of a corpse. The skin was slightly wrinkled, but had not changed color. It had only become a little more transparent, showing after a fashion the color of the tendons, the fat, and the muscles, wherever it rested directly upon them. It also had a rosy tint which is not ordinarily seen in embalmed corpses. Dr. Martout explained this anomaly by saying that if the colony had actually been dried alive, the globules of the blood were not decomposed, but simply collected in the capillary vessels of the skin and subjacent tissues, where they still preserved their proper color, and could be seen more easily than otherwise on account of the semi-transparency of the skin. The uniform had become much too large, as might be readily understood, though it did not seem at a casual glance that the members had become deformed. The hands were dry and angular, but the nails, although a little bent inward toward the root, had preserved all their freshness. The only very noticeable change was the excessive depression of the abdominal walls, which seemed crowded downward to the posterior side. At the right, a slight elevation indicated the place of the liver. A tap of the finger on the various parts of the body produced a sound like that from dry leather. While Leon was pointing out these details to his audience and doing the honors of his mummy, he awkwardly broke off the lower part of the right ear, and a little piece of the colonel remained in his hand. This trifling accident might have passed unnoticed had not Clementine, who followed with visible emotion all the movements of her lover, dropped her candle and uttered a cry of affright. All gathered around her. Leon took her in his arms and carried her to a chair. Monsieur Renault ran after salts. She was as pale as death, and seemed on the point of fainting. She soon recovered, however, and reassured them all by a charming smile. Pardon me, she said, for such a ridiculous exhibition of terror. But what Monsieur Leon was saying to us, and then, that figure which seemed slipping, it appeared to me that the poor man was going to open his mouth and cry out when he was injured. Leon hastened to close the walnut box, while Monsieur Martou picked up the piece of ear and put it in his pocket. But Clementine, while continuing to smile and make apologies, was overcome by a fresh access of emotion and melted into tears. The engineer threw himself at her feet, poured forth excuses and tender phrases, and did all he could to console her inexplicable grief. Clementine dried her eyes, looked prettier than ever, and sighed fit to break her heart, without knowing why. "'Beast that I am,' muttered Leon, thinning his hair. "'On the day when I see her again after three years' of absence, I can think of nothing more soul inspiring than showing her mummies.' He launched a kick at the triple coffin of the colonel, saying, "'I wish the devil had the confounded colonel.' No, cried Clementine, with redoubled energy and emotion. Do not curse him, Monsieur Leon. He has suffered so much. Ah, poor, poor, unfortunate man. Mademoiselle Sambuco felt a little ashamed. She made excuses for her niece, and declared that never, since her tenderness childhood, had she manifested such extreme sensitiveness. Clementine was no sensitive plant. She was not even a romantic schoolgirl. Her youth had not been nourished by Anne Radcliffe. She did not trouble herself about ghosts, and she would go through the house very tranquilly at ten o'clock at night without a candle. When her mother died, some months before Leon's departure, she did not wish to have any one share with her the sad satisfaction of watching and praying in the death chamber. This will teach us, said the aunt, what staying up after ten o'clock does. 
What? It is midnight, within a quarter of an hour. Come, my child, you will recover fast enough after you get to bed. Clementine arose submissively, but at the moment of leaving the laboratory she retraced her steps, and with a caprice more inexplicable than her grief, she absolutely demanded to see the mummy of the colonel again. Her aunt scolded in vain. In spite of the remarks of Mademoiselle Sambuco and all the others present, she reopened the walnut box, knelt down beside the mummy, and kissed it on the forehead. Poor man, says she, rising, how cold he is. Monsieur Leon, promise me that if he is dead, you will have him laid in consecrated ground. As you please, mademoiselle. I intended to send him to the anthropological museum, with my father's permission, but you know that we can refuse you nothing. Selections from The Man with the Broken Ear, used by permission of Henry Holt and company. The Man Without a Country Forthwith, the colonel marched and opened the windows with a precipitation which upset the gazers among the crowd. People, said he, I have knocked down a hundred beggarly pardures, who respect neither sex nor infirmity. For the benefit of those who are not satisfied, I will state that I call myself Colonel Fougas on the 23rd, and Vive l'Empereur. A confused mixture of plaudits, cries, laughs, and jeers answered the unprecedented elocution. Leon Reynold hastened out to make apologies to all to whom they were due. He invited a few friends to dine the same evening with the terrible colonel, and of course he did not forget to send a special messenger to Clementine. Fugaz, after speaking to the people, returned to his hosts, swinging himself along with a swaggering air, set himself astride a chair, took hold of the ends of his mustache, and said, Well, come, let's talk the supper. I've been sick, then, very sick. That's incredible. I feel entirely well. I am hungry, and moreover, while waiting for dinner, I'll try a glass of your schnick. Madame Renault went out, gave an order, and returned in an instant. But tell me, then, where am I? resumed the colonel. By this paraphernalia of work, I recognize a disciple of Urania, possibly a friend of Monge and Berthollet. But the cordial friendliness impressed on your countenances proves to me that you are not natives of this land of sauerkraut. Yes, I believe it from the beatings of my heart. Friends, we have the same fatherland. The kindness of your reception, even where there are no other indications, would have satisfied me that you are French. What accidents have brought you so far from our native soil? Children of my country, what tempest has thrown you upon this inhospitable shore? My dear colonel, replied Monsieur Nibor, if you want to become very wise, you will not ask so many questions at once. Allow us the pleasure of instructing you quietly and in order, for you have a great many things to learn. The colonel flushed with anger and answered sharply, At all events, you are not the man to teach them to me, my little gentleman. A drop of blood which fell on his hand changed the current of his thoughts. Hold on, said he. Am I bleeding? That will amount to nothing. Circulation is re-established, and your broken ear. He quickly carried his hand to his ear and said, It's certainly so, but devil take me if I recollect this accident. I'll make you a little dressing, and in a couple of days there will be no trace of it left. Don't give yourself the trouble, my dear Hippocrates. A pinch of powder is a sovereign cure. Monsieur Nibor set to work to dress the ear in a little less military fashion. During his operations, Leon re-entered. Ah, ah, said he to the doctor, you are repairing the harm I did. Foundation, cried Fougas, escaping from the hands of Monsieur Nibor so as to seize Leon by the collar. Was it you, you rascal, that hurt my ear? Leon was very good-natured, but his patience failed him. He pushed his man roughly aside. Yes, sir, it was I who tore your ear, in pulling it. And if that little misfortune had not happened to me, it is certain that you would have been today six feet underground. It is I who saved your life after buying you with my money when you were not valued at more than twenty-five louis. It is I who have passed three days and two nights in cramming charcoal under your boiler. It is my father who gave you the clothes you now have on. You are in our house. Drink the little glass of brandy Gotton just brought you. But for God's sake, give up the habit of calling me rascal, of calling my mother good mother, and of flinging our friends into the street and calling them beggarly pandours. The colonel, all them funded, held out his hand to Leon, Monsieur Renault, and the doctor, gallantly kissed the hand of Madame Renault, swallowed at a gulp a claret glass filled to the brim with brandy, and said in a subdued voice, Most excellent friends, forget the vagaries of an impulsive but generous soul. To subdue my passions shall hereafter be my law. After conquering all the nations in the universe, it is well to conquer one's self. This said, he submitted his ear to Monsieur Nibor, who finished dressing it. But, said he, summoning up his recollections, they did not shoot me, then? No. And I was frozen to death in the tower? Not quite. Why has my uniform been taken off? I see. I am a prisoner. You are free. Free? Bib l'empereur. But then there is not a moment to lose. How many leagues is it to Danzig? It is very far. What do you call this chicken coop of town? Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau? In France? Prefecture of Seine et Marne. We are going to introduce to you this sub-prefect, whom you just pitched into the street. 
What the devil are your sub prefects to me? I have a message from the Emperor to General Rapp, and I must start this very day for Danzig. God knows whether I'll be there in time. My poor colonel, you will arrive too late. Danzig is given up. That's impossible. Since when? About forty six years ago. Thunder, I did not understand that you were mocking me. Miss Unibor placed in his hand a calendar and said, See for yourself. It is now the seventeenth of August, eighteen fifty nine. You went to sleep in the tower of Liebenfield on the eleventh of November, eighteen thirteen. There have been, then, forty-six years, within three months, during which the world has moved on without you. Twenty-four and forty-six? But then, I will be seventy years old, according to your statement. Your vitality clearly shows that you are still twenty-four. He shrugged his shoulders, tore up the calendar, and said, meeting the floor with his foot, Your almanac is a humbug. Monsieur Renault ran to his library, took up half a dozen books at haphazard, and made him read, at the foot of the title pages, the dates 1826, 1833, 1847 and 1858. Pardon me, said Fugas, his head in his hands. What has happened to me is so new. I do not think that another human being was ever subjected to such a trial. I am seventy years old. Good Madame Renault went and got a looking glass from the bathroom and gave it to him, saying, Look. He took the glass in both hands and was silently occupied in resuming acquaintance with himself when a hand organ came into the court and began playing Partant pour les Zeries. Fugaz threw the mirror to the ground and cried out, What is that you are telling me? I hear the little song of Queen Hortense. Monsieur Renault patiently explained to him, while picking up the pieces of the mirror, that the pretty little song of Queen Hortense had become a national air, and even an official one, since the regiment bands had substituted the gentle melody for the first Malsoyes, and that our soldiers, strange to say, had not fought any the worse for it. But the colonel had already opened the window and was crying out to the Savoyard with the organ. Eh, hey, friend! A Napoleon for you, if you will tell me in what year I am drawing the breath of life. The artist began dancing as lightly as possible, playing on his musical instrument. Advance at the order, cried the colonel, and keep that devilish machine still. A little penny, my good monsieur. It is not a penny that I'll give you, but a Napoleon, if you'll tell what year it is. Oh, but that's funny. Hi, hi, hi. And if you don't tell me quicker than this amounts to, I'll cut your ears off. The subajar ran away, but he came back pretty soon, having meditated during his flight on the maxim, nothing risk, nothing gain. Monsieur, said he in a whittling voice, this is the year 1859. Good, cried Fougas. He felt in his pockets for money and found nothing there. Leon saw his predicament and flung twenty francs into the court. Before shutting the window, he pointed out to the right the facade of the pretty little new building where the colonel could distinctly read, Audrey Architect, 1859. A perfectly satisfactory piece of evidence, and one which should not cost twenty francs. Fougas, a little confused, pressed Leon's hand and said to him, My friend, I do not forget that confidence is the first duty from gratitude toward beneficence. But tell me of our country. I tread the sacred soil where I receive my being, and I am ignorant of the career of my native land. France is still the queen of the world, is she not? Certainly, said Leon. How is the emperor? Well, and the empress? Very well. And the king of Rome, the prince imperial, he is a very fine child. How? A fine child? And you have the face to say that this is 1859? Monsieur Nibor took up the conversation and explained in a few words that the reigning sovereign of France was not Napoleon I, but Napoleon III. But then, cried Fougas, my emperor is dead. Yes. Impossible. Tell me anything you will but that. My emperor is immortal. Monsieur Nibor and the Reynolds, who were not quite professional historians, were obliged to give him a summary of the history of our century. Someone went after a big book written by Monsieur de Norbien and illustrated with fine engravings by Raffet. He only believed in the presence of truth when he could touch her with his hand, and still cried out almost every moment. That's impossible. This is not history that you're reading to me. It is a romance written to make soldiers weep. This young man must indeed have a strong and well-tempered soul, for he learned in forty minutes all the woeful events which fortune had scattered through eighteen years, from the first abdication up to the death of the king of Rome. Less happy than his old companions in arms, he had no interval of repose between these terrible and repeated shocks, all beating upon his heart at the same time. One could have feared that the blow might prove mortal, and poor Fugaz die in the first hour of his recovered life. But the imp of a fellow yielded and recovered himself in quick succession like a spring. He cried out with admiration of hearing of the five battles of the campaign in France. He reddened with grief at the farewells of Fontainebleau. The return from the Isle of Elba transfigured his handsome and noble countenance. At Waterloo his heart rushed in with the last army of the empire, and there shattered itself. Then he clenched his fists and said between his teeth, If I had been there at the head of the 23rd, Blutcher and Wellington would have seen another fate. The invasion, the truce, the martyr of St. Helena, 
the ghastly terror of europe the mother of murat the idol of the cavalry the deaths of ney bruno mouton du bernet and so many other whole soul men whom he had known admired and loved threw him into a series of paroxysms of rage but nothing crushed him in hearing of the death of napoleon he swore that he would eat the heart of england the slow agony of the pale and interesting hire of the empire inspired him with a passion to tear the vitals out of austria when the drama was over and the curtain fell on schrambron he dashed away his tears and said it is well i have lived in a moment a man's entire life now show me the map of france leon began to turn over the leaves of an atlas while m renault attempted to continue narrating to the colonel the history of the restoration and of the monarchy of eighteen thirty but fugas's interest was in other things what do i care he said if a couple of hundred babblers of deputies put one king in place of another kings i have seen enough of them in the dirt if the empire had lasted ten years longer i could have had a king for the bootblack when the atlas was placed before him he at once cried out with profound disdain that's france but soon two years of pitying affection escaping from his eyes swelled the rivers ardeche and gironde he kissed the map and said with an emotion which communicated itself to nearly all those who were present forgive me poor our love for insulting your misfortunes those scoundrels whom we always whipped have profited by my sleep to pare down your frontiers but little or great rich or poor you are my mother and i love you as a faithful son here is corsica where the giant of our age was born here is toulouse where i first saw the light here is nancy where i felt my heart awakened where perhaps she whom i called my igloo waits for me still france do has the temple in my soul this arm is thine thou shalt find me ever ready to shed my blood to the last drop in defending or avenging thee End of section 4